to Hungry for Answers with me, Robin Clare, recovery coach professional. Do you love food, alcohol, drugs, sex, social media, cigarettes, or gambling a little too much? The traditional narrative says that addiction to these vices is the problem. The truth is they are just symptoms. This hit show takes you from recovery to your ultimate life as my special guests and I help you discover how underneath every vice is the addiction to the suffering that developed due to unhealed trauma. So what can you do? Hungry for Answers provides groundbreaking proven solutions from my best-selling spiritual book, Feast and Famine, Healing Addiction with Grace. It's time to stop suffering and start living your ultimate life. You have a divine right to a life filled with love, joy, peace, and abundance. Hungry for Answers starts now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hungry for Answers. On today's episode, I have Sharon Valenti, and I'm just going to read a little bit from Sharon's bio because she's so interesting. Um, Sharon Valenti is a serial entrepreneur, coach, and teacher. She has worked with celebrities, millionaires, casino owners, inventors, other coaches, as well as everyday people. She is the leading expert in helping people achieve the life they've only dreamed of. She is compassionate, thinks outside the box, and curious about life. Her tumultuous early years and lives... <clears throat> excuse me, and subsequently finding her way into a life she loves led her to want to help others to do the same. And she is confident that and through her work that she can bring out the best in people and make them feel more confident, which leads to more success and home and at work. And so today's topic is about loving yourself, which is not easy um, I think it takes a tremendous amount of work to get to a place where you love yourself. And so Sharon and I are going to talk today about uh, self-limiting beliefs and how do we how do we get to love ourselves and what happens if we don't and how do we manage the holidays and how does not loving ourselves impact addiction and recovery. So welcome Sharon to the show. Thank you so, so much for having me on here, Robin. Do we have about five hours to cover all this? <laughs> yes, no kidding. We have one hour, but I was thinking we, there's so much to talk about, even in this one topic about loving yourself, because yes. it is the key to everything and it is the hardest thing to do. So the first question I always ask my guest is, have you ever been so hungry for answers in your life that you weren't sure where the answers were, were going to come from? And, and can you give us an example? Yes. So my whole early years in life, right through teenage, right through early 20s, so hungry for answers. I just, I was in a mindset because of all that had happened in my young years that this was the only way life would ever be for me, that the good life was for other people. And at the same time, I said, I wonder what I could do to have a life like that. I just dream about that kind of life. But I'd also, because, and I didn't know this at the time, because of the underlying beliefs I had about myself, I believed that I would never mm -hmm. have that kind of life. And, as I moved forward and I had enough of suffering, I just, I just knew there had to be a different way. And I knew that at that particular moment, my life was really literally in danger. And so I made the decision to move out of where I was living and take my two children, of course, with me. And thus began a long search, got my hands on every book that I could, every back then we used CDs and the little Walkman things and talking to people, joining meetup groups and applying as much as I could. I mean, self-help books and tapes are only as good as the, the person receiving the information, applying it into their lives. But the biggest mm -hmm. change was when I learned how to question what I was believing about myself. First, recognize what I was believing about mm. myself. And as I backtrack, 
I know for many of us, we picked up beliefs about ourselves when we were very young. You know, mother or father might have said, I, I'm going to punish you for whatever you did. And the child mind says, I'm a bad person. I'm not lovable. Mommy, daddy doesn't mm. love me. And that sticks. How we know at three or four years old to even think that, I don't know. We do take on beliefs like that. Then, and of course, that's not what mom and dad said. They simply said they're going to beat you, spank you, whatever term they use. But we took on the belief. And then it carries through in elementary school where you do something naughty and the teacher puts you in the corner or singles you out. That reinforces, I'm not lovable, I'm a bad person. Fast forward, we gain all these other beliefs along the way, and they all are so unconscious and they're also deeply rooted. We become oblivious to the fact that they are running our lives until you're able to find them and look at them and see how they showed up in your life. And then begins mm -hmm. the self love. People will say, Oh, you need to love yourself. Great. How do I do it? I will say Louise Hay started that pathway for me in her salad story. Yeah. We've all gone and we've taken out of the fridge lettuce that's not so hot looking, but we pick around it, we put it in the dish and the crinkled little cherry tomatoes and cut the slimy piece off the cucumber. And she says, would you serve that salad to your guests? And the truth is we wouldn't. We would go and get nice new produce, right? Because we want them to think we care and like about them, which is something, again, we've been taught to do, put everybody else before ourselves. But the question in that is, why would you do more for another than you would do for yourself? Take that back to what I just said. Again, we're taught, let them, let the company get seated first, let them help themselves first, let them go through the door first. Mm -hmm. Is so entrenched in us that for many of us to do an act of kindness or something loving for ourselves, we feel guilty. There's a twinge of guilt mm -hmm. because we haven't put somebody <laughs> before us, right? Always. And so let me let me ask you this. Let's let's break let's break down what you said. Um, so what is a self-limiting belief? And how do we know if a belief is positive or self-limiting? So if you have believed unconsciously all your life, you're unlovable. Let's say starting with the childhood, you got the belief, I'm unlovable. It's been reinforced unconsciously throughout. And I ask you, Robin, can you, can you know 100% for sure that you're unlovable? What would your answer be? When you think on it, can you know 100% for sure you're unlovable? I don't, well, let me see. I'm not sure it's a, it's can an only be, it can only, can only be yeah. yes or no, or everybody suffers some form of not enoughness, tall enough, short enough, yes. lovable enough, et cetera. So the minute you find that you're, you don't know 100% for sure, you're not lovable or that your parent didn't love you in that situation, yeah. then what's left? I am lovable. Oh my God, yeah. I've been lovable all this time. But that mm -hmm. belief, I had a, I worked for a pharmaceutical company for a while and I was always smiling, always cheerful, always the people pleaser, which is a whole nother subject matter. And this clinical sci scientist said, it's, it's unnatural for people to smile all the time. I heard you're unnatural for smiling all the time. And that one particular thought played over and over and over in my mind. It created a lot of suffering until I looked back on the situation and I identified what she had actually said was, it's not natural for people to smile all the time. So the belief that I'm unnatural fell away immediately because I realized what I've been believing wasn't true. It's perfectly natural for people to be happy or I'm not likable or any one of these other things. Yes. You know, to tie that into holidays, any holiday, especially this time of the year for those that celebrate Christmas, for example, 
sometimes they don't even like the people whose house they're going to. And they, they, ref they don't say no, they don't give an honest no. And underneath that fear of saying no is, oh, they might not speak to me anymore, they might not like me, or it might cause a big problem. To Who cares? You don't like them, you don't want to go anyhow. So why are you saying yes to something you don't want to be at? What are all those underlying beliefs? Is Can you absolutely know it's true they're not going to talk to you again or that you'll hurt their feelings? We don't have the power to hurt another person or to make another person feel any particular way. I don't want to make them sad, mad, glad, the... You can't do that to somebody else any more than they can do that to you. If somebody gets triggered, if somebody gets angry, it's because of an underlying belief they have. If yes. you get angry, it's because you've got an underlying belief about yourself. There's something reflected back to you about you in that moment that we gloss over because it's so unconscious and it's been with us so long, we don't even know to identify it. So here's some, let me, let me, let me interject yeah. here. So that's, this is one of the things that I've, I've, when, when, as my children were growing up and now they're, you know, su successful adults, I would always say, stop playing conversations, anticipating what conversations are going to be with somebody else, because you can never anticipate what they're going to say. Right. And most often it's never as bad as we think it is. But when we do that, when we, pl when we play that, those that conversation over and over again I also think we're triggering our own self-limiting beliefs because we're we're just sitting there saying oh my god what are they going to say what I, I don't want to hurt them just like you said you can't hurt them unless they're triggering their own self beliefs so it's it, it's very interesting and one other thing I was also thinking about when you were speaking this idea, um, what I have found over and over again as an entrepreneur, that in the entrepreneurial cycle, sometimes you're on the upswing and sometimes you're, it's almost like work is going away because I believe, and it always proves out to be that something new is coming, right? It's, um, it's like a cycle of, of yeah. growth and then, or ebb and flow, you know, flow and then ebb and then flow. But I even know, even someone as myself who lives in examined life, when the work starts to slow down, I start thinking, oh, maybe I'm not smart enough. Maybe I'm, I'm disappointing them. Like all these things start coming until the spiritual part of me and the person who's been in therapy for many, many years steps in and says, wait, this is the universe opening another window for me. And I just, or another door, and I just need to step through. But that initial reaction to that just gets me every time when I'm, when I'm in that downward, you know, things are slowing down. I start panicking, like there's something wrong with me. So I think, is, is, that, a, is that an example of my self-limiting beliefs kicking in until I say, wait, what am I thinking about here? This is not actually what's going on. If it's a belief about yourself, yeah, so I'm not doing something right. I'm yeah. not, it's not enoughness. I'm making me wrong. I'm the victim over and over and over and over. It takes as much energy to create a curious, positive thought as it does all those negative thoughts. It really is mm -hmm. a matter of retraining our brain over and over and over to say, wow, it's quiet now. What? The minute you say what, the brain goes into solution mode. What can I do that can turn this around? So get yourself out of the mm -hmm. habit of putting yourself down and look for solutions instead. What can I do? This is fun. This gives me time to clean the closets, you know, da-da-da-da-da. Train yourself, train <laughs> yourself, train yourself until the new neural pathways are fully established in the mindset of only seeing the good. Those old ones will begin to die off at some point. The minute you identify one of those not enoughness, you know, again, in that statement, you say, oh, you know, this isn't, is this me? Stop yourself. What am I believing about me? Mm -hmm. Is that absolutely true? Is it true? I'm not good at what I do. Hell no, it's not. I'm excellent at what I do kind of thing. We're quick to be in the victim mindset 
why what need what need is being served when you put yourself in the victim mindset to more people say oh poor you let me commit you know they say misery loves company mm -hmm. right we're like magnets you know oh yeah poor you, my business is bad too when I was in a real estate career and we had the down market, I didn't feed into it. I just kept right on selling and selling and listing and selling. I was never impacted by it at all because yeah. I didn't feed into it. It's important not to feed into. And you know, they say you're the sum of the five people you surround yourself with. Don't look at your immediate family. Look at the podcasts you follow, the people that you, those are my five people, the people I follow online. I hear great information. I learn every day because I've trained myself to do that. Putting myself on the back burner never served me. Believing I was yes. not smart enough. I, I walked out of projects. I backed out of projects because I had this belief I wasn't intelligent enough to, to be the team leader. And of course I am. It was just that belief I had. And once I question, is it really true I'm unintelligent? Well, no, of course it's not. It just falls away because now I see the truth. And what's left is I am intelligent. What's left is I am a good businesswoman. I know what I need to do to turn my business so it's generating business right you do but what need does that serve in you to think those dark negative things that's the bigger question is it fulfilling the need to make them right me wrong or vice versa me right yeah. you know, yeah. what what need is that fulfilling and do you really want to get stuck there the other thing we are trained absolutely is to look outside of ourselves for appreciation, for approval, for like, for love. It's never outside of ourselves. It's not my husband's job to love me. It's his love to give, right? I can't force him, but I could get ticked off in my own. Oh, he doesn't love me enough. But it, I, I'm the only one who knows what it looks like to support myself in the way I want or love myself or like myself yes. when we put that burden on somebody else we set them up to fail we set ourselves up to be disappointed because that was at my expectation not theirs you know, and they can't live up to my expectation we do it all the time yes. though Robin right we, we do, do that oh, all for the time sure. for sure I remember very early on very early on in my marriage, we've been married 33 years. I said to my husband, it's your job to make me happy. And he looked right at me, goes, no, it's not. That's and right. I'm like, it's not like, I was really seriously thinking yeah. it's not your yeah. job. Like, and then of course we've, we've grown since then. We're going to go to break now, Sharon. So you're listening to hungry for answers with Robin Claire, and we'll be right back. Hello and welcome back to Hungry for Answers with me, Robin Claire. To learn more about my work, please go to clarity.com. That's C L A R E dash I T Y dot com. And I'm here with Sharon Valenti, Transformation Coach. Sharon, how can people best reach you? They could, if they want to reach me personally, they can send an email to info at is it true? Dot com and they can visit our website of the same name and blueprint for stress that's stress s t r e s is in sam s is in sam release blueprint for re spit it out blueprint for stress release.com mm -hmm. so thank you so one of the topics i want to talk about is how do our self-limiting beliefs impact our health and our addictive nature. Uh, the addictive nature, as the, the multitudes of people I've worked with, are people's way of looking for relief in all the wrong places. Mm -hmm. There are either a trauma that's caused a belief about themselves, as in my own childhood, um, being molested by my father 
I blamed myself for it. It was just too much for me to see this hero as a bad person. So I blamed myself. I took on all the shame around it. I even took it as far in my child mind that if I wasn't born, this would have never happened. That's how much blame I took on myself. And I didn't understand that or even recognize it until I was in my 30s. I buried it, as a matter of fact. And it ran my life in, a, in many, many relationships that I had. Um, and, and being able to look back and see, are you attracted to the same kind of people, same kind of circumstances? You'll see, and, and I know you're using the word self-limiting, which is accurate. It's those untrue beliefs is what it is. Those beliefs that we believe because they feel so real up here where we keep dwelling on them again unconsciously, and yet they're not true. They're just going on in our mind over and over and over again. And just some of the earlier conversations that we had, just recognizing that if you're, if you're suffering in your life and your life isn't the way you want it, that's because you have a choice. And for now, you've chosen to be a victim of everyone including yourself because of those thoughts that are tormenting you one in one of in both courses we start by writing a letter to the person that hurt us the most and folks this is not a nice mm -hmm. letter this person severely hurt you so it's not dear so and so it's like you are a you know vicious vile person you beat me you abuse me whatever it is in the next paragraph, this is how I felt at the time, and I always say courage, keep it one word. I felt abandoned, rejected, unloved, unwanted, like I should be dead, whatever, whatever, whatever. When you, and there's more to it. But in that second paragraph, when you identify how you felt at the time, you are actually uncovering your underlying beliefs. And as you move on to see, take one belief at a time, I'm um, I'm unlovable. I, I know I keep going back to that. Let's see. A rejected. You know, I felt rejected at the time. Look back in your life history and how many times did you feel rejected by people mm -hmm. or circumstances? And the only one who is rejecting you is yourself. The only one who's not loving you is yourself. The only one who's uncaring is you because you keep replaying these stories and you're believing it about yourself. And when you see that it's, and, and in the beginning, this might be hard to see. And the people in your life that helped, helped you adopt those beliefs about yourself, one thing I do know with absolute clarity today is they, in that moment that they were creating this havoc in your life, we're doing the best they could. And yes. then people I'm want to say, that. you know, they want to say BS on that, but it's not. It, it, no, you know, it's the truth. It is the truth. You know, I look at like, for, for those my age, you know, Marvin Gaye, and he had this big, you know, the father and son had an argument, the father killed him. As in that enraged moment, that was the best the man could do. A second later, he's probably like, oh my God, I just killed my son kind of thing. But we are... We are serial killers, child molesters, you name it, are doing the best we all are. And maybe, you know, the next minute, that's your next best thing or the moment before. So I can now look back. I don't, I don't personally forgive people because forgiveness to me, I'm still holding them hostage in the back of my mind. Yes. I accept. It's like, yes. I accept that's the way you are. I, love that. I, I choose not to participate anymore. It has a completely different feeling to me in accepting. I accept it's a blue sky out there or a gray sky. I don't need to forgive the sky for what it's doing. I just accept it. And there's and no arguing. In the teachings that I've studied, we, we've looked at the, the unconditional love yeah. as acceptance without judgment. And so when looking at the relationship with those who have 
really hurt you and you know change the course of your life based upon their abuse you have to accept in order to move forward you need to accept what you were saying that they were doing the very best that they could with the knowledge they had at the time or or the problems they had at the time but you never have to condone Correct. what they did to you there's a difference there between acceptance and condoning so i just wanted to share that with everybody so that you don't think that when we're saying acceptance we're saying you know ex accept what they did to you we just have to accept that it happened yes. because until you accept what is what happened and what is it's very hard to move forward to a healthier life it's it's when we're not in acceptance is when we're playing that scenario over and over and over and we've all been there where something has happened i call it woulda coulda shoulda woulda coulda shoulda you know i just i'm like why am i doing that it is what happened i accept it and i don't like it and i don't have to but I have to move, I have to move forward. Yeah. This is about my life. Yeah, exactly, Robin, exactly. Um, one of my mantras that I, I live by today is, how do I know it should be that way? Because it is. And it's pretty much what you said, just different words, but that helped me. How do I know it should have been that way? Because it was. And that's it, it's gone. There's, it's pointless to say, oh my gosh, should be different, shoulda, 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 shoulda. The shoulds, forget it. It's done, folks. It's done. You know, uh, to rewind with my father, because I, I've encountered this with people, it, staying in the, the victim of that would have been to say, how could he do that to his only daughter? He loves me and, you know, I, he's supposed to love me. They said, never let that happen and don't let people, oh, poor me, poor me, poor me. But I'm not aware that I'm doing poor me and it's victim. I keep wanting to blame outside of blame, a blame, a blame. And that just keeps me suffering. It happened once or twice, but it's happened 5,000 times over the years in my mind or 5 million right. times even. Yes. It's me who's keeping it alive. And in that acceptance, and like you said, I, I have nothing to do with me. I never did after that with my father. It's, it's gone. It's done. Next. If we keep, and we all have heard this, even if we keep physical things from our past, every time you look at it, it's going to take you in your past. If you really want to keep moving forward, ideally, you will remove everything from your past. I, mean, I have things, my son died and I, I have little things from him. I moved, so I wasn't constantly reminded, but I, I recognize, I just heard that recently. And I'm like, yeah, every time I look at that bowl he gave me, I remember the moment and I could allow myself to get sad about it. But I take my mantra, how do I know he should have passed away? Because he did, and I can't change that. Now I could make myself a victim and say, oh, poor me, what am I gonna do? My child died, da, 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 da. I'm not minimizing death to anybody or mocking it. I just believe we are eternal and I'll see him again someday. And he gives me a lot of evidence um, to support that. So I choose let's, yeah, I'm sorry. Let, let's just repeat what you said, your mantra. How do I know if it, it should, should have happened? No, not if. How do I know it should have happened that way? Because okay. it did. How do I know it should because have it happened did. that way? Because it did. How well, can you argue should, with that? Yeah, should is one of those words in your personal transformation journey that you try to move out of your out of your language. And you know, there's always that joke: stop shooting on on yourself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Like, because should is really a tough word because should is suggesting that something that that you are in, that you're trying to change something that's already happened in the past. And you can't do that. Right. It's already happened. Right. You can't change it. And, and the fact that you want to change it in your mind is what's driving you crazy right is 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 creating that thought yeah. process that maybe i could have done something differently well you can't it's done you can't it's, it's already good. done it's yeah. already done and but i think we do that in all parts of our lives 
maybe as you know in parenting at work in 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 community in, in with our health right like here's an example i broke a tooth yesterday i know how i broke that tooth i i was kind of like picking out on gingin i don't know if you've ever had one of those no. but they're really difficult to chew ginger candies and the whole time i'm having them i'm thinking you shouldn't have those you're gonna break a tooth oh right so now am i sitting here saying i shouldn't have had the gingins of course i am but then i'm like well i guess i had the gingins lesson learned no more gingins right with yeah. my you know my my teeth but i can't beat myself up so today i went to the dentist and we're moving forward right? good and so let's go right. to another yeah. question. Yeah, let's talk about the the. Um, it's funny. Some of these are we've already we've already answered. But how how do we get through the holidays without feeling triggered and staying in love with ourselves? Well, you you may still get triggered, and mm -hmm. just invite yourself to. In as quickly as you can reflect what was reflected back to me about myself in that moment that I just react, you know, had an re internal reaction. And it may take you a minute or two to really peel that layer away to find out what you were believing about yourself. I'm going to give anger as an example. Anger is always some kind of belief that it's a not enoughness belief. Frank, do you, do, he's in the middle of watching a sports game, totally entranced or one of his old Western movies. And I come down in his new clothes and hey, honey, do you like this? And he gives a quick glance, yeah, it looks nice. My mind is, son of a gun, he didn't even pay attention, just quick glance. I want him to look at my whole outfit. I'm going to get this whole story going. Then I'm shut down and put the invisible wall in between and all the other stupid things that we do to ourselves. All he said was, yeah, honey, nice, right? But I'm now doing all this additional damage. But underneath that anger is the belief he doesn't love me enough to really pay attention to me. He doesn't care about me enough to stop what he's doing. The fact that I've interrupted him, he should drop everything and give his all attention to me. That's where I want to talk about the three businesses very quickly. There are three kinds of business. Mm -hmm. There is yours, there is mine, and there's the divine's. The only time you can get in trouble is when you're in somebody else's business. And that's even if you're in your mind. You're sitting with people thinking, oh, that, let's say you're dining with friends and they use their utensils differently than you might. And you're sitting there thinking, God, oh, they should be, look how they're eating. They should be doing that differently. Da, 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 da. Whose business is it how they eat, right? Or what they wore to come out for dinner. We're so in people's business, even if it's in our head. You drive it along, you're going somewhere to meet someone, <laughs> rehearsing yeah. the whole conversation. You get there, you're a little bit, PO'd in the moment, they're innocent. They have no idea why you'd be frosty with them, right? They, they have had no part in that conversation, but now you've got your blood pressure up in the whole thing, or opposite, you could be all excited, ready to see them, et cetera, et cetera. And they're not in such a good mood when you get there because they've also had a mental conversation. We must take responsibility for ourselves. Pointing the finger out at other people for what's going on inside of me, is not the solution. They are innocent. It's me with my thoughts that feel so real mm -hmm. in my mind. I need to question, is what I'm thinking right now even true? You know, when someone cuts you off on the road, what's the first reaction, right? Many of us, we're frightened in that moment. Oh my God, you scared the daylights out of me. But we've also, to your point, which you mentioned something earlier, we quickly see the accident has happened, the blood, the gore, the everything else, the ambulance coming to pick us up, having a call. None of that happened outside of my mind, right? All that happened was somebody, why not instead say, wow, I wonder where they're going in such a hurry. I wonder if they got bad news, I have to get home. We don't, we've been so programmed to look at the worst thing in life. When we talk about fear, I don't believe we are born fearful. I believe we have a, um, a self-preservation mechanism but if you take a six-year-old i mean a six-month-old or or 
yeah, six month old or one year old and you put them in the middle of the highway, they don't know to be afraid. They right. just don't. They're still happy kids until they're taught to be afraid. It's don't touch this, you'll get burned. Don't do that, you'll get killed across it. It's all don't, 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 don't. And again, subliminal programming until we don't even think about it. We don't question anything. We've just, have you ever heard, don't walk under a ladder, it's bad luck or sure. break a mirror seven years. Why do we believe some things and not others? Because it's not so drilled into us, but I bet most people still avoid walking under a ladder, right? I've got well, so you know, I, I, I get I get that with um, Mercury retrograde, you know, I'm, I'm a spiritual teacher and people are like, well, don't you know it's Mercury retrograde? I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> and I don't want to know because I don't want this, that to stop me from doing collaboration Thanks. deals with other others yeah. or, or, or booking clients. I, I just, I don't want to know from that. Yeah. And um, so, but then there's other superstitions that are like right there. So um, we're going to go to a break. You're listening to Hungry for Answers with me, Robin Claire, and my guest, Sharon Valenti. We'll be right back. Hello, and welcome back to Hungry for Answers with me, Robin Claire. So I offer a free 30 minute consultation to talk about really whatever you want to talk about <laughs> in regards to recovery, life coaching. Um, and so that's available on my website, clarity.com, C L A R E dash I T Y dot com. And I'm really excited to say that I have a new product out. I'm showing the folks that are watching. It's called the Right Recovery Journal. And it's a wonderful book that takes you from the fear of writing all the way to writing your recovery life story. And it's filled with some really great writing prompts and fun activities. So it is a journal. Um, and I think I think you'll really enjoy it. So you can buy that on amazon.com. And so I'm here with Sharon Valenti. She's a transformation coach. And I believe her website is isittrue.com, which is great. Um, and Sharon, in the last segment, you talked about that there are three types of thoughts, mine, Business, yeah. yours, and the divine. Yeah. And you talked about mine and yours and how you get in trouble if you're in somebody else's trying to figure out what somebody else is thinking. Can you talk about the divine? What, what did you mean by that? Sure. So we had that earthquake recently in Kentucky that did a lot of devastation. And it was, a, it was unfortunate and people died, of course. That's the divine's business. I can't do anything about what happened or an earthquake or any other forest fires but if i get on my high horse cause oh my goodness here let's do gofundmes and this 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 whatever gofundme money i get will take care of that much but i could make it my mission and that's all i talk about and that's none of my business that is divinely controlled i i don't have any say in that. And I'm sticking my nose in the divine's business. I trust the world, the earth, the universe to unfold in a perfect way. It does. Are we contributing to pollution? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Potentially. Is that my business? Yes, to a degree. To I, I choose to be more mindful about recycling and things like that. Um, I also know well, I don't know for fact, I don't know anything for fact unless it's happened here, but we, we watch the news, right? And not to, not to sound delusional, I am not, but if I were to watch the news and I don't make a point of doing so, then I would feed into everything that's on screen and I don't even know if it's true. I'm not there firsthand witnessing it, but I've created a whole story around it. The news reporter says one thing and my mind is now seeing this much more around it without questioning, is it true? And if it's causing me to feel upset, why would I, I watch it? But I was going to rewind. Forest fires apparently cause the most 
pollution out of anything else. Now, a forest fire can happen by lightning as well as human beings, right? That's the divine's business. I have no control over lightning striking a tree. But if I say, oh my God, that forest fire, and oh my, the poor animals, now I'm getting a whole story going and I'm getting myself worked up over something. I have absolutely no control and it's already happened. People are going to say, oh, but then you're going to say, how do I know it should have happened that way? Because it did actually, yes. It happened and it happened that way. So for me to argue about that forest fire started by a bolt of lightning that I have no control over, who does that serve? Nobody, it doesn't serve me well to dwell on something like that. Even, well, you asked me a question earlier about how it affects health. When we dwell on something, and especially unconsciously, if we hold on to anger or a trauma long enough without expressing it in a constructive way, it has to manifest some way. Anger typically, anger that's been bottled up for years, typically will manifest as cancer, different forms of cancer. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of other physical ailments that manifest it's like the body telling you last resort change your thinking yes because you've got something going on the body on. the pain is the... absolutely pain is your body's way of telling you something is wrong it's not a punishment so just going back to the this little whole segment that you that you just shared with us you're not asking people not to care you're asking people to manage their own life to the best that they can yes. to become the most grounded, healthy, productive person that they can. And when that happens, they then send out a ripple of energy out into their family, their community, to the world. So the best way to help heal the earth, help heal humanity is to heal yourself. Absolutely. Okay. 100%. And I think that's really what you're saying, yes. that when when we heal ourselves, for first of all, when we also heal ourselves, and this could be a whole nother topic, we're healing our, our generations past and our generations forward. So when we become the hero of our own life by doing our own healing, the, the impact is incredible. And I remember when writing my first book, Messiah Within, when, when I wrote, world peace begins inside your own heart, right? It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily, if, if we had world peace inside each of our own hearts, there would be no war. We wouldn't, if we saw each other as ourselves, right? If we saw each other as, as a divine spark of, of, of God or goddess, whatever you're into, we would never fight with anyone, especially such serious fighting we might still fight because we're human beings and we don't get along but we would never initiate war over something as silly as land or your god is better than your god so this whole conversation is really about minding your own thoughts yeah yeah right? I, I ask people all the time i said would you like a billion dollars or peaceful thoughts there's some often, but they understand peaceful thoughts. We got that. Nothing is upsetting you. And healing yourself really is looking at taking that look at what you're believing and finding out if it's even true. And when you see it never is, you let it go. And when you're in your own business, remember, you are literally creating your life with the stories that you've got going mm -hmm. all day long. I mean, from the moment we get up in the morning and get dressed, there is an unconscious thought behind what you pick out for the day. You're thinking unconsciously who you're going to be interacting with and you want to dress in a way that you think will impress them. Understand first and foremost, we have no control over anybody else's perception of us any more than they, than they have control over how we perceive them. So we can all stop doing the Cirque du Soleil act, just show up as you. They're gonna love you or, or not love you, right? And, yeah. and just 
taking care of yourself, you absolutely, it, your energy, your physical energy changes. When you're in a happy mood, you know when you see people have just had a good laugh and you walk into the room, there is an energetic, just the same as somebody who's had a bad argument, you can feel the tension, yeah. right? I mean, you just feel so that is proof right there. We've all experienced those moments that we give off energy and that's the ripple effect. If we are healing ourselves, it does have that. I've experienced it first and you have too. There is a ripple effect. People want to be around you when you're calm you. and when you're nice. And, uh, and we want to be around people who are like that as well. If we're in business and we want to thrive, then we're going to choose the most energetic business people to follow because their energy pumps us up, right? If you want to feel calm, you're going to put on calming meditation music. We are affected by all the energy out there, taking care of our own energy first by looking inside, seeing where we're suffering. I know where I was going with that thoughts before. Because we are creating our own reality with our thoughts, then everybody is right the because your reality is right your reality is right for you that's your truth right the problem comes when we start trying to make others believe our reality is better than their reality if everybody would understand you're creating it you know and just leave it alone to your my religious but forget it your religion's right for you and yours is right for you and just coexist, yeah. live in interdependently, accept each other, be unconditional. You don't have to be um, dependent, codependent, independent, just be interdependent. You're okay the way you are and you cohabitate. Just, you don't try and change anybody. I think yeah. so. Yeah, so right? Perfect, yeah. And so I wanna talk about your blueprint for stress relief, which is one of your products. And yeah, and one of the things that you said to me when we first met is that you think it, that it's important for you to get the blueprint for stress release into the hands of teens and young adults. Can you share yes. with us what is this blueprint and why is it so important for teens and young adults? So it's really for everybody. My focus, though, is because of my own and many people I talk and everything starts when we're younger knowing how sad and unhappy and I hated my parents and they'd be the last people I'd ever seek advice from and and I was ashamed so I didn't tell my friends I felt very alone rejected etc and very suicidal and I thought okay today's teens with the with the social media impact as well and they're they're taking those likes personally instead of understanding that we're liking what you posted had not happened that people don't even know me when they put the likes you know so i understand they're liking my post if i and the blueprint is simply starting as i said with a letter and there's more to that letter and identifying those underlying beliefs you have on about yourself and then through the rest of the six weeks you're putting one at a time those against worksheets until you've worked through every one of those beliefs to see if they were really true or not and as i said when you see that you that being a, you were never unlovable you just immediately know well that means i've always been lovable and it's actually quite emotional there's a lot you know it's just like such mm -hmm. a relief to say oh my gosh i am lovable somebody loves me out there you know i love mm -hmm. myself and questioning it all the way down you know we get i do it and then what and then what and then what if um if if i'm not lovable or if i run out of money if i run out of money uh, what what what's the worst thing that could happen i'll lose my house and then what well i won't have any place to live and then what oh i don't have any food i'll be out on the streets and then what nobody will want to be around with me i'll be all smelly and da, 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 da. and then what i'll be all by myself well you always are the only one you ever have but bringing all those fears to the surface 
you're not going to be on your own. You're not going to be out in the streets. There's always some place you can go. Somebody's always going to feed you. You yep. don't know that you're necessarily going to lose your house. Maybe the fairy godmother will step in and pay it off for you kind of thing. Well, we just never know what will attract, but bringing the, that up. So these courses and the focus on young adults and teens, if I could prevent one suicide, you know, that's, that's a worthy cause for me. Helping them learn how to question what's going on in their mind right now as a teen, so they don't have to wait till yeah. they're 50 or 60, gives them a chance at a happy, well, that's what I was balanced life. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was going to say. Let's get them, let's get them learning how to have a healthy life and how to manage their own thoughts now and how to manage their own emotions. And if they're armed with those tools, then, then they move into the rest of their life, you know, really creating the life that's most important to them. Absolutely. So we're gonna be ending the show soon. Sharon, thank you so much for coming on. And, and Sharon Valenti at isittrue.com. And yes, just remember folks, you're never alone. There's always people that you can reach out to, whether, whether it's, um, you know, therapist, a life coach, a program, a religious organization, even a lot of organizations are on Zoom. So if you're feeling alone for the holidays, please know that you, you can do things online. There's going to be a lot, a lot of ceremonies and people are looking to to eat with other people online. So you could set up your tables and just, you know, talk to each other. So anyway, there's that, but of course there's always looking inside of yourself and recognizing your own soul and your heart energy and know that your connection to the divine source starts within. So stay tuned for our next show of Hungry for Answers. And for now, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into Hungry for Answers. Learning to love ourselves is the one true solution to addiction. Make a commitment to healing today and see how you can reach your ultimate potential. Remember, you have a divine right to a life filled with love, joy, peace, and abundance. To learn more about me and my offerings, please go to clarity.com. That's Claire, C-L-A-R-E, dash I-T-Y.com. See you next time.